Oh my God, vegetables are evil. This is crazy. And now you look at the data of the average American, they eat less than three vegetables a day. I think when people say vegetables are dangerous, it's because they don't like them. Incorporating vegetables into your diet improves your longevity. You know, 90% of all the pesticides that are made in the world are made for our food. They're not made for spiders in our house. So you gotta wash your food before you eat it. Here's a cheap hack for washing your vegetables too, is people that have kidney disease, right before they're getting ready to be put on dialysis, you know what they're told by their nephrologist? First of all, thank you for being here, Dr. Jim. Yeah, yeah. And uh, sure. you know, we, uh, you came highly recommended from a friend of ours. And you know, you've written multiple books, you're a speaker, you know, you do research. So um, yeah, let's, I mean, maybe like, Give us a little bit of your backstory on who you are and how you arrived at where you are today. Yeah, you know, it's been 40 years of just kind of being on a journey of, you know, how do I get well? How do I become better? But more importantly, you know, how can I serve other people to get better? You know, how I started out was, you know, I kind of got out of pharmacy school and I didn't plan on being a, I mean, I just picked pharmacy school almost random. I mean, to be honest with you, I was going to be an athlete and I was a, blue chip collegiate athlete, you know, got the scholarship, went to an all-star game. I uh, got a collapsed disc in my neck after my 15th tackle, went to the orthopod and he said, guess what? Your playing days are over. And that kind of, kind of crushed me. You know, I mean, I didn't really have another plan, um, but I did have, a, I did get into pharmacy school at one of the top pharmacy schools in the country at the time. And they're still, you know, you know, very well respected was University of Cincinnati. And, and, and it was interesting there because we studied a lot. We still had pharmacognosy there. We still had a course on studying plants. And our founder was the, you know, the world famous botanical extractor in the 1800s. So I don't know if it was subconsciously kind of getting in there. And plus I started bodybuilding, you know, qualified for a national event. And so it was kind of getting into this stuff. But when you try to bodybuild and you try to go to school and you try to be an intern and you try to make extra money because you don't have a free ride anymore and your parents don't have money, I beat myself up. And I was already kind of a sick, like as a kid, I was pretty sick. So 20, 20 years old, I looked like, you know, amazing, right? Sculpted. Felt like I was 90 years old. But what um, were you sick from? Right? Well, it was, it was really from um, just, you know, a lifetime of antibiotics. You know, you get into training, you're eating a lot of carbs in order to train while I'm feeding candida, I'm getting blood sugar drops, you know, passing out after I get back from training and up my couch, you know, falling asleep in class, you know. And um, the biggest thing was I went to someone who, who you know, evaluated me. Uh, put me on a program, you know, low allergen diet, clean up your gut, help restore adrenal function, get your blood sugar better, changed my life. I felt amazing. And so I started incorporating that stuff. I got out of pharmacy school. What really set all this off was just the fact that I'm behind the counter. They put me in really rough neighborhoods because I was like 260 pounds of a big knot of a muscle. Mm -hmm. And, uh, one night, a lady came up to me with a diabetes medication, and all my family was diabetic. My grandmother was a fingerless, toeless, blind diabetic. My grandmother used to feel Sad. my face with her amputated fingers to see how mm. I grew. I'd stand in front of her at age five. You know, mm. kind of scary when you're a little kid, right? Yeah. My father was diabetic, and uh, I just looked at her grocery cart and said, is there any way I could help you? Can I show you around the store, which I was not supposed to do? Uh, I was not supposed to leave the pharmacy, but I didn't know any better. I was brand new out of school. Mm -hmm. And I went around, showed her some stuff. Two weeks later in the roughest neighborhood in the greater Cincinnati area, I got 12 more people lined up to do the grocery store tour. So I went to Kroger's wow. and I said, hey, I want to tag foods for heart health and diabetes health. I want to screen people for blood sugar and screen people for lipids. I want to write a grocery store guide to eating healthy. Got turned down by the the lead, the president at Kroger's, but then my, my marketing manager for pharmacy said, yes, we found more diabetics, sold more glucometers, created a, a food tagging system. What was FDA regulated approved first food tagging system that went national. 
And that put a bug under my tail that was just like, I got to keep going. So I left pharmacy formally and got into consulting. And then from there, it was, um, you know, teaching at the university 18 years in the College of Medicine and Pharmacy while I wrote four databases on natural products, uh, APHA endorsed. Uh, I, you know, wrote my first 10 books. You know, I mean, I just was, uh, I was passionate about this, man. I mean, I just couldn't get enough. And I started a practice. So I've been in practice almost 40 years, tearing people's chemistries apart and figuring out what to do. And in that journey, that was everything from developing programs for Bayer and uh, McKesson and Kroger and Rite Aid and CVS to doing things with the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine and the uh, International Academy of Clinical Nutrition. I was on the board there, um, on the advisory board at A4M, as well as being the academic co-chair. I chair the International Peptide Society, work with athletes in all five major league sports, work with special forces, do education with them. Um, and uh, really, I just can't get enough of this, man. I'm going to be 64 years old uh, pretty soon here, like uh, in May. And I still, I still wake up every morning going, man, what, it, what, what do we get to discover today? Uh, because yeah, you have find, massive drive. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's awesome. I think my staff thinks I'm going to burn them all out. Uh, but <laughs> I, what, what can you say? But, you know, I mean, in the end, one of the things that I found in this whole space is that sometimes we make the complex too complex. And what I've really worked really hard at is trying to, how do you simplify a lot of information? that you get on somebody, their symptoms, their labs, what kind of labs. That, you know, led me to do in the cloud-based informatics platform that we developed called the Metabolic Code. That's actually going in. We're going to be testing probably half a million lives uh, with one of our customers where we're going to have data. I mean, here's the deal. Here's what holds us back, right? When you start, if you're on drugs, you're taking nutrients, you're eating a certain way, you're exercising a certain way, how are you sleeping, how much caffeine are you taking in? How does, when you change someone's program, they do something, let's look at the data, of the, the totality of what they're doing so we can actually show them what we do matters because we had that talk. We, you know, you guys pre-screened me. You guys are believers because you walk the walk to help your own personal journey, right? Like you guys discovered an, an amazing personal journey of healing. That happened to me. And I'm proud to say, worked on probably 100,000 lives personally and probably another million through the clinicians that I work with. And, you know, people deserve to understand how they can be well. So that's what drove me. That's what got me here. And, you know, big believer, you know, because when you think about it, I reached out to a Medicaid case at 8.55 p.m. in a barred up pharmacy, you know, bars on doors. And that led to changing millions of lives. And, and what that's all about is just be a service, man. It doesn't matter who it is sitting in front of you. Be a service. Reach out. Help somebody. You know? And that's what really drives me. I love that you're empowering people to understand their own health. Because, like you said, for all three of us, that's what got us on this journey. Because we were sick and we took it into our own hands to figure it out. Right? Yeah. And, um, yeah. And, you know, like even things like blood tests where I'm a pharmacist too. And I look at the, the things. I'm like, all right. I was taught what the normal ranges are, but do I really know what it means? You know? And so maybe you can talk about your book a little bit. Um, blood never lies because in that book, you break down how people can understand their blood. Yeah. Well, right? I, you know, you nailed it. I mean, I think, you know, in healthcare, what we're used to is you get a blood test and then you get a call from your doc or the nurse and they go, Oh, everything's normal. Yeah. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> it means you yeah. haven't crossed the line to be ill yet. And so there's a lot of data about trending analysis. Like there's two studies on blood sugar that just blows, that blows my mind. The Kaiser Permanente study was 47,000 lives over a decade. 6% risk of becoming a diabetic in the next decade for every point over 84. Point so people are walking around with a 95 blood sugar getting patted on the back saying they're normal when they got a 60% risk of being a person with diabetes. And that's before wow. you factor in their blood, their like their their uh, blood pressure, their kidney function. I mean, all the other stuff that shows you they're on their way. The other thing they found: as soon as your blood sugar's in the nineties, you're already starting to damage your endothelial system. Your blood vessels are getting damaged. The other study that came out in two thousand twenty-two, 
9% risk of becoming a diabetic for every point above 90. So, you know, I mean, the thing that I don't think people get, why did the Ozembic revolution occur? We got half the population walking around that are overweight. They may not be classified as diabetic yet, but they're like on their way. It's like that old story, you know, one step can make a lot of difference. Like if I'm a mile away from the Grand Canyon, my next step doesn't mean too much. If I'm the, on the edge of the Grand Canyon, that same one step means a lot, right? So the Blood Never Lies book, Your Blood Never Lies, and I'm doing my second version of that right, actually right now. I'm finishing the edits on it. The, um, what that book is about is teaching you to read your labs for wellness. How far am I away from being well? Where am I trending where I could make a difference and shut off that, that, that movement or that path towards a condition like heart disease, diabetes, autoimmune disorders, you know, colitis, whatever, right? Whatever That's it a is. good point. Yeah, because like, okay, your number might be fine, but what's the trend of that number? Is it going up? Is it going down, right? Alex, didn't you have a recent experience where you went to the doctor, they did the test and you were like, they're like, yeah, it looks great. But you were like, well, I don't feel that great. So what's the problem? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it's it's funny because I've, I've been a big – uh, like proponent of labs for many years. So I have 20 years worth of my labs. And, you know, even when I was younger, the doctor was like, why are you so obsessed with this? I say, because in 20 years, if you tell me something's off, I don't want to say, has it always been off? Or is it just this year? You know? And then the other sure. flip side to it is, you know, I had something that was off recently and I forget what it was. And, and the doctor was like, well, you know, you're close to 50. You should see the labs of the 50 year olds that come in here. They're horrible. Your labs are 99% perfect and you're obsessed over one thing that was off. You know, you're fine. And I was like, that's not my perspective on things, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. No, I mean, it, you know, in the end, it's am I optimal or not? If I'm not optimal, what can I do about it? You know, and not in an erotic way, not in something that drives anxiety. It's out of a proactive way to say, hey, when I'm 80, I still want to be getting after it. When I'm 85, I want to be getting after it. Now, I know a lot of futurists are like, you can live to 120. I, I know there's technology. We're going to get there. But right now, nobody's even living to 70 healthy. Well, that's what and it that's is, you know. Yeah. And, you know, the one thing that, that I feel, you know, you talk about technology and the advancement of medicine. And I think labs are the one, like, real major thing that we have today that no one's really ever had before where you can dial in every piece of everything you're doing you know, and use that tool to, you know, better your life. You know, everyone's like, oh, I take vitamin C. Do, do you know why you take vitamin C? Do you check your levels? You just take one, one pill, a thousand milligrams a day, every day. Right. Yeah, that's it. I mean, there's, there's no doubt, you know, you, uh, why guess? Why guess when you can figure out what you actually need to take? I mean, that's been one of my big, I guess it's been one of my big pet peeves about our whole space on the, you know, what I call quote, precision health side or functional medicine, regenerative medicine. I don't care what you label it, right? Integrative medicine, holistic medicine. It's like, oh, you need a multi. You need vitamin D. You need a probiotic. Uh, you know, you, you, you need to take something for your joint here. Before you know it, I have so many people come to me that are on 20 products or 30 products or 40 products and they're not well. And I look at their labs and I, and I go, well, you're not doing anything that's affecting these big movers of why you're aging. You know, you're not affecting your blood sugar. You're not affecting your inflammation in your body. You're not affecting the bad actor lipids like oxidized LDL. You can take a bucket full of stuff. I mean, I never met a supplement I didn't like. I mean, my, I mean, my books, I mean, I cover 250 nutrients and look at the new ones every year. I love them, right? You know, they're cool, but when do they apply, right? When do they apply? Like create, and I think labs are incredibly important for us to figure that out. And there's advanced labs too. When it comes to uh, anti-aging, what are the key labs that people should be looking at? Well, if you look at it from a straight lab test that everybody can get, right? You go to a lab core or a quest, and then we can go to a little more exotic, but you know, the, the big ones, you should know your glucose and insulin without a doubt. That's a biggie. Okay, you know, why is that? So blood glucose is the amount of sugar in your bloodstream. 
Uh, the reason you're you're looking for that is is the higher your glucose gets, the more you move towards being a person that's either insulin resistant or diabetic, which is the most inflammatory event that can happen to your body, and that's going to accelerate your aging, meaning uh, the terms metaflammation which is in the medical literature, metabolic inflammation leads to inflam aging. So when you don't regulate your blood sugar well, right, and your insulin levels are high, your blood vessels are going to get small, your blood pressure is going to go up, your blood vessels are going to get nicked and dinged up, you're going to calcify, and then the, the rest of the problems with elevated glucose occurs like, you know, dementia, now also known as type 3 diabetes, kidney disease, Walk out the door, man. There's a kidney dialysis center at every corner, right? So to me, glucose and insulin is a number one actor. The second one would be cortisol, managing your stress hormones. We know, for example, if you're someone that's got poor glucose regulation, chances are you'll live 10 to 13 years less than somebody who doesn't have that problem. And that stress, so you know, when you flatten your cortisol curve is what it's called, you're supposed to make stress hormones in the morning. It drops at noon. It drops again at four. It drops again at bedtime. So your body can go, hey, there's no white tiger chasing me anymore. I can go to sleep. I can rejuvenate my body. Well, over half the population has trouble sleeping at some point this year. And where people mess up is they don't understand that if you're having trouble sleeping, it's a disorder of hyperarousal. You got too much cortisol coursing through you, too much stress. And why is that important? When you flatten that cortisol curve, where you just the white tiger's chasing you all day long, right? You, what happens is, is you create a 333% increased chance of cardiometabolic disease. You increase your chance of neurodegenerative disorders, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, and mood disorder risk goes up a bunch. So cortisol, insulin, glucose. And then I like to look at other things. What's your kidney filtration like? GFR, right? Glomerular filtration rate. What's your C-reactive protein like as a marker for inflammation? Mean platelet volume, another thing you can get as a marker of inflammation. And then one that you can get, but a lot of people don't order, is a diponectin. A diponectin you can get at Quest or LabCorp. It's incredibly important because it shows you how much oxidative stress you're under. And how and how stressed your insulin receptors are. And, you know, it's, you know, and it, I mean, I can go through a plethora of important labs, but just on the basics, like, yes, sex hormones are important as you're aging. When a woman enters menopause, when she loses her estradiol, she automatically starts to create more pro-inflammatory glycans in every cell of her body. And that's going to make her more prone to die of a, of a heart attack, which more women die of heart disease postmenopausal than men. Uh, and then men, when their testosterone goes low, more prone for kidney disease, more for, prone for mood disorders, more prone for bone breaks. Um, and, and so, you know, sex hormones are important. Things like thyroid hormone are important. Not too much, not too little. What I still find we're doing is like, oh, you have low testosterone. Jack it up. Right. And it's more about where's homeostasis at? Where is your body taking in and breathing out? It's repairing and at the same time performing. Because How do you know that? Well, I think numbers do that. For one, how do you feel? You know, where's your, where's your heart rate, right? Heart rate above 62 usually indicates you're becoming sympathetic dominant. If you've got a resting heart rate above 70, you're definitely sympathetic dominant. Where's your blood pressure at? What's your heart rate recovery like? You know, where is your glucose at? So, you know, when you trigger inflammation in your body, your joints may not hurt, but you may have autoimmune experience, right? Something may be up that way, whether it's, you know, lupus or rheumatoid or psoriatic arthritis or whatever. But the key is, is understanding that anything that's showing there's metabolic inflammation in your body means that that's that you're burning too rich right you're pro-inflammatory pro-inflammatory equals accelerated aging so whether it's hey um i eat too much i eat too often i eat too late and i pick the wrong foods and i don't work out and i don't get enough sleep right there's one 
Probably right. nobody ever falls into that, though. I, that's by everybody. <laughs> yeah. yeah, everybody's picking. Around. Never heard of that. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, you, you can't get all your chemicals unless you go to Chick Fil A. So you may as well just you know get them in. <laughs> uh, so the, the point being is, when you look at a lab test, it's a reflection of what the environment has done to you. Meaning, what did you get exposed to? how you ate, how you were raised, what are your lifestyle habits? And not just not enough exercise, but are you exercising too much, right? And then what you do to yourself. You know, am I stressed out? Now, do I drink too much alcohol? What are the things that I'm doing to myself? And yes, your genetics play a role, probably about 20%, maybe a little less. I mean, I, you know, it's really more about your epigenetics. You know, what gets expressed due to the totality of what's happened to you from the time you're in your mother's womb to today. And, you know, that's what you're trying to look for, right? That's the key. So what I heard were two main things, sugar and inflammation, which actually sugar can also drive inflammation too, right? So it's kind of like this cycle. Um, so what are the big levers that we can push to help people improve those things? The third one is stress and cortisol levels. because that's the, that's the biggie. Those are the biggies. All right, so, so the most damaging, number one most damaging thing to your arteries is postprandial hyperglycemia. That's after a meal, right? After a meal, you eat a meal and your blood sugar shoots up and then you release insulin and you release cortisol too and you release adrenaline and you create oxidative stress. So how do I eat you know, to spare that? Now, you know, poor people, you know, do I eat FODMAP? Do I do vegan? Do I do vegan? Do I do carnivore? Do I do a carnivore, vegan, vegan, my FODMAP diet? You know, how do I eat, right? The first, you know, and, and it's easy. Um, in my opinion, I've been teaching the same way to eat for a lot of years. Um, you need a plant forward diet. People should eat vegetables. My lunch today was a big salad with a bunch of different colors of vegetables in it. And I had some nice organic chicken on top of it pretty, and some beans. I'm pretty happy about that. You know, I did an okay job. But I think, you know, for one, if you don't check your blood sugar, you can either get a CGM, right, a continuous glucose monitor. You can find out, hey, when I eat this, my blood sugar goes up really high. And typically when that's going to happen is when you eat a lot of carbs, you eat a lot of sweets, you know, you might drink, uh, you think you're drinking a healthy green drink. It's got 88 grams of sugar in it, but it's green. So <laughs> the marketing on it makes you think it's good, yeah. but it's not so good. So really starting to think about a higher protein breakfast. And the reason for that is, is that you don't, you know, you, your, your cortisol is highest in the morning, which is where you'll be the most insulin insensitive, Right. You know, your insulin won't work as good in the morning. So you want to eat a high protein that fuels your brain. Um, obviously, there's a lot of folks on the fasting kick. I mean, I, look, I did 12, 12 eating. People want to go to 14, 10, fine. But I've seen so many people come into me doing 16, 8 every day and their labs look terrible. They just look bad. I mean, I, you know. But what are they I, eating, I, though? You know, is well, that a reflection you know, on the labs or is it the fasting that's causing that? Well, I, I think it's both. I mean, you know, I think for one, people think because they're doing 18-6, they could just fuel all they want and eat what they need to. So that's dysfunction. Um, and then when you looked at what they did at the Keck Center for Longevity at USC, because I did a lot of lecturing for uh, Walter Longa's uh, fasting mimic diet program and got access to a lot of data. When they had their animals that were doing 16-8 and they sacrificed them, they were seeing a lot of atrophy in organs. So you don't get nutrients to your system. So I think that, you know, uh, how many, if, if, if I go to Sardinia where more people live to 100 than anyone in the world, right? Are they doing 16-8 fasting? When I go to Okinawa, are they doing 16-8 fasting? If I go to Loma Linda, are they doing 16-8 fasting? If I go to Icarus Greece, are they doing 16-8 fasting? No. Well, I mean, you know, we take these things out of context, right? I mean, you know, it's like, I agree. Fat, like, why does fasting work here? Because people are so insulin resistant. When they start doing it, it starts to correct their blood sugar. 
but it's a little bit like putting a Band-Aid on a bullet hole because you're really not correcting your blood sugar. You're just preventing the way you handle glucose from occurring. What you really want to do is fix your glucogen and glycogen issue, which could be due to a number of things, right? So eating uh, what I call modified low-carb, low-allergen, anti-inflammatory diet as a baseline. Watch, watch. Some people are sensitive to gluten. Some people are sensitive to dairy in our culture, right? I get them off of it, see how they feel. Um, so I think food, and that's a topic we could talk about for hours, right? Eating the kind, what, what kind of foods and why. And, and I don't think there's any one way. So if you have an athlete eating, you know, that's training four hours a day, their needs to eat are different, right? But I can tell you that most people that train about an hour, five days a week, and the rest of the time they're sitting in a chair, or maybe they're going, maybe they're if they're good, they're getting that 50-minute zone two walk in five days a week like they should be. Uh, you know, if they're doing all that, you usually don't need to eat that much. You know, I, you know, I, oh, I got to drink a pre-workout drink, an intra-workout drink, a post-workout drink, and then I got to load up, right? I mean, you know, so I think there's a lot of that that you want to you want to be sure of that you you start to delve into understanding what's the right food for me. How do I feel? Am I gassy? Am I bloated? Am I tired after I eat? Do I get rashes? Do I get itchy? Does my heart rate go up? You know, you could measure your heart rate. Your heart rate going up after you eat. That tells you you got a sympathetic tone issue. So. That's one big thing, eating better. Um, Got it. Now for fasting, um, you know, what are your thoughts on longer fasts? Let's say 48 hours, 72, one week. You know, we've spoken to some experts that say you fast for a week, you can reverse autoimmune disease. Now, man, we wouldn't have any autoimmune disease because I know a lot of people motivated. I mean, I, I think that if you're picking a long fast every so often, three months. Yeah. Once in a while. Yeah. I, I think there's some positive data to that without a doubt. There's some positive data on a three day fast. Here's the only issue you got. You got a lot of people that are insulin resistant out there that if they are trying it and they're not that experienced or aren't in a safe place and they can pass out, you know? Uh, so I'm very careful about talking about, yeah, extended fast, depending on how dysglycemic someone is. You got to watch the the risk of gallstones if you're doing them, you know, regularly. Um, but I mean, I, I'm not against that type of, you know, you know, for lack of a better term, uh, vision quest for someone. Right. That's really what it becomes. It becomes, a, I think, a, a structuring of you taking control of your appetite again. And then the down regulation of nutrient sensing. Right, which allows you to turn on stem cells, help to decrease inflammation, trigger autophagy, which is you know the vacuum cleaner for your waste products in your cells. So all of that's good. It's real good. Um, so I do like that. All those are shown to come from fasting. Yeah, they do. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, you know, telomere lengthening is complex, man. I mean, yeah, I think you can get some telomere lengthening because guess why? You're shutting down inflammation. Like telomeres shorten because of inflammation. Tel shorter telomeres don't cause inflammation. So if you don't eat and you don't have a lot of gastric issues, like, hey, you know, you're, you know, you're not, you know, your tight junctions aren't sloppy. You don't have gut permeability anymore because you've healed your gut. You haven't put food into your gut, so you get what's called digestive rest, right? And then, you know, you kind of restructure your immune signaling. Yeah, telomeres come back. You know, um, I haven't seen a lot of people with their testosterone jumped up, but I mean, if it's in the literature, cool, I'm okay with it. Long as you can do it. Long as you can do it, right? That's the only, that's the only prerequisite why I, whenever I get asked about extended fasts, it's be in a safe place. If you're really confident in how you're feeling, keep it going, right? But if you start to feel like you're going into a tailspin, you're getting dysglycemic, you're getting lightheaded, you know, you got to either got to like drink a little bit of molasses water or, you know, something. Because uh, otherwise you start getting into some, you know, danger zone stuff, you know. But I think they have, I think it has value. Got it. Now you mentioned um, veggies before, how it's good to eat veggies. Uh, can you help uh, shed some light on your perspective? 
we're getting a lot of comments, a lot of people talking about the dangers of vegetables. Uh, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right? Why, it's interesting. That's why, the, that's why all the centurions, all the centurion cultures eat lots of vegetables. That's because they're dying from eating them. You know, I mean, I just, I, I hate being very straightforward and critical of that kind of thinking, but it's very nearsighted. Oh my God, a vegetable makes a pesticide in order to keep a bug off of it. So when you eat that vegetable, you're actually eating a pesticide and that's going to kill you. Um, uh, you know, not so much. Most of the data shows that incorporating vegetables into your diet actually improves your longevity. So, I mean, it's very cool to talk about being a carnivore right now. A uh, problem is when you eat a high fat, a high protein diet like that, especially a high meat diet, you also make a lot of circulating endotoxin in your intestine. When you make a lot of circulating endotoxin, that crosses your blood brain barrier and it attaches to all your organs and triggers inflammation signaling over time. I'm not saying it doesn't work for the short term. It might work in the short term. I'm talking about lifestyle changes. How do you live a lifestyle? And what's endotoxin? Where does that come from? Endotoxin is lipopolysaccharide. And it comes from the breakdown of your, your diversity of your gut. So when you, when, you, when you don't have fiber, you don't feed your flora, you don't make butyrate, and that means that, 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 that the little epithelial cells, one cell layer thick, don't have the butyrate they need to stay nice and fat and healthy. Uh, and so lipopolysaccharide is, other than insulin, is probably the most pleuroinflammatory compound your body makes. And it's a byproduct of bacteria breaking down in your gut. And it's been published multiple times that eating high fat, high, uh, high protein diets release circulating endotoxin. And circulating endotoxin or LPS has been tied to the progression of diabetes, heart disease, dementia, neuroinflammation. I mean, it's, you know, I, I, um, it, it's, I think, I think when people say vegetables are dangerous, it's because they don't like them. I mean, I don't know. At me at 64 years old, I, I think it's, I, I think I'm in pretty good shape, right? I'll, I'll get in, I'll get into the, gym with anybody and I'm not wrinkled up. I don't have a lot of oxidative stress in my body. I haven't done a bunch of face work to make it look this way. Right. Um, and I, I think that whenever we skew our diet, I, and look, I think vegetarians got it wrong. All right. I think when we skew our diet in any one way, I think we lose opportunity for nutrients. And then in the end we eat to create lab values that are better for us. Eat so that your blood sugar and insulin are corrected. Eat so that your monocytes and your eosinophils and your basophils, which are white blood cells that you get in a differential of your blood, so they're not cranked really high, throwing out a bunch of inflammatory signaling in your body, right? Eat so that if you're an, like I'm an APOE34, it's a genetic test, APOE, apolipoprotein E34. I can't eat a lot of saturated fat. If I eat more than 20 grams of sat fat a day, I'm pushing myself right into the dementia risk, right? How do you, so how do you figure that out? Blood test, your favorite, Alex's <laughs> favorite. It's a blood. It's a blood, all right? You, you get an, you're either an APOE 3-4 or 4-4, much higher risk of heart disease, much higher risk of dementia. And it's not just eating too much sat fat. It's alcohol is an issue with that gene snip too. So, you know, food's an incredible thing because people get religious about it. Yeah, we're getting some crazy comments, you know, people unfollowing us and things like that. Um, and, you know, they're, they, they do have some pretty sound arguments, at least appears so, when it comes to, you know, hating vegetables, right? Like they, they say things like phytic acid, oxalates. Um, so what do you have to say to that? And what are some studies that you can show that show the contrary, you know? Why do they have an oxalate problem? Because they are, they're chronically metabolically inflamed. They haven't got to the root of their problem. They've gotten sensitive to os oxalates. They get sensitive to phenolic compounds. Doesn't mean that it's a bad food. It means that they have a problem with a food, right? It's like you should be on a journey to discover why do I have that oxalate issue? Not everyone has an oxalate issue. So if it was bad, like universally bad, like drinking bleach, it's pretty universally bad. Right? Everybody would be in bad shape if they're drinking beet juice. Everybody would be in bad shape if they were eating oxalates. That's and a good that, point. Yeah. That, now, that, that, that's what I'm trying to say is 
everybody in their own little universe, they find out what's bad for them, and then they become a champion of why it's bad for everyone. And in our reality, if we're good researchers, like, look, I don't, like I said, food isn't a religion to me, man. I love food. My father was one of the most decorated chefs in the world. I mean, literally the top hundred chefs in the world, national chef of the year in the United States. I mean, I know food and I love good food, but at the same time and food, people should be able to be enjoying it. So the people eating oxalates in France and people eating oxalates in Italy and in Okinawa, are they all having the same condition problems we're having? No. Probably not. Uh, no, they're not. So does that make the oxalate bad or does it make our reaction to the oxalate bad? And that's where I try to get people to understand, you know, when we get to the point where we start, I've already been through this journey with people. It's like, look, how many foods are you allowed to eat now? Uh, 12. How long do you think you can sustain that? Right. Why not heal your immune system, heal your gut lining, heal your metabolism of oxalates so that you're able to tolerate. And maybe you never can, t like, I can't eat a lot of dairy, guys. Like, I can do gluten pretty decent here and there. I can't do it a lot, but I can, I can tolerate it without any problems. I feel good. Dairy from cow's milk. I, and that was my problem growing up as a kid. My dad worked 16-hour days or bring me a milkshake every night or ice cream Sunday. I lived with sinus infections my whole childhood. I mean, I, I thought the pink stuff, the amoxicillin bubblegum flavor was part of my meal plan. You know, I know, me too. Tap, I feel it. Yeah. Right? And a dime a tap, the purple, that was my dessert. Great flavor. <laughs> oh, that stuff was good. I love taking that at bedtime. But the issue is, even to this day, dairy's a problem for me. I've tried everything to try to correct it. It just isn't going to happen. Right? So we do have those individualities that are there. But the thought that, you know, any oxalate containing vegetable is dangerous for every human being. It just doesn't prove out. Just look around. I, mean, I, I, you know, I try to be, you know, doctor obvious, you know, I, not in a bad way. Cause I love everybody. I want everybody to get their fullest expression of their health. Right. But you know, you'll have people that'll live with that. They're going to live with that yoke on their back. They're carrying that rucksack of their problems. And they have to be able, they have to be able to take that rucksack off. So be able to enjoy more food, to be able to enjoy a bigger variety, to be able to enjoy not having to think about every next thing you're going to put in your body and if you're going to react or not. That's, man, that's money when you can do that for people. Because we got when I started practice 40 years ago, I rarely had a child that had severe eczema or had eosinophilic esophagitis. 40 years later, man, there's whole hospital wings devoted to children who's got eosinophilic esophagitis due to food reactions that they have. And that's because of their mother's immune system that got passed to them because their mothers never got cleaned up the way they deserve to be cleaned up. So we perpetuate this myth of foods being bad, right? So anyway, I'm not passionate today, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, kick it up for us, would you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, we're, we're all chronically ill, right, in one way or another. And, and I think this is the biggest thing. You know, all the experts we've talked to, all the doctors we speak to, that's a universal thing. Chronic illness, mostly chronic inflammation, right? And everybody's got a different answer. Some people say it's your gut. Other people say it's the food you're eating. Other people say maybe it's EMFs or, you know, things like that, you know, and like, how do we how do we get people to like universally really understand like 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 recently we had, we had a doctor on the show that said you know it's olive oil is cause all of it you know he's, he was saying olive oil is causing cancer and and you know the, the 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 audience lost their minds they were like this is impossible this guy's a liar i never want to hear from you guys again and and they they ran off you know ha, too bad you need diversity of thought in order to discover where you're at they should be listening to you no matter what no matter how outlandish the thought is, like you have a practice, like, like I'll tell you, you know who I have respect for? And I don't care if they're using dowsing rods. I have respect for people that are sitting in front of people and getting them well. Like I go, I have, a, I have two clinics. I've been working on people for 40 years. I don't even have advertisement. In my clinics, I got a waiting list. You know why? Because I get people well, right? 
And I don't, I might not get everybody all the way there. Look, I'm not going to tell you like I'm a miracle worker because I'm not. I'm just a disciplined person that says your genetics count, the way you eat counts, the amount of stress you're under counts, the amount of drugs that you've taken and for how long counts, you know, environmental exposures, lifestyle and, and exercise and sleep, right? All these things kind of add up to who we are. You know, you can say, I wake up every morning. I put on my nubby Birkenstocks. I do shots of wheatgrass. I do my morning sun salute. I go talk to my plant. I, for 30 minutes, I unload all my troubles on my plant. I send my plant to therapy because I know how much I unloaded on it. Right? I got all that going on. Right? So I'm doing everything so perfect that it's stressing me out and scaring me. If I do something out of the, just a little bit out of range, right? And I, so I think it's really important that people need to give themselves grace, but they need to continue to search for what feels right to them. Like for us in my clinic, we take a fairly, and what I teach, I mean, I just got back this weekend. I taught 140 doctors in our peptide module at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. I was on stage in the hormone module for 275 docs, right? In the end, you know, it's what's bothering this person the most that's sitting in front of you? How can I start to get them to feel better quickest so that they want to stay on the journey? Right? Yeah. yeah. Like if I can get you to start to feel a little better, I always make the comment, if I can get you to poop better and have less gas in the first visit, everybody's going to love me forever, right? You know, it's like... And then, of course, foggy headedness. Think about this, man. People are complaining of their memory when they're 35 now. I'm foggy headed. I'm pushing a thought through jello. You know, I got a midday crash. I got to do 600 milligrams of caffeine before I work out or I can't work out. Right. I mean, you, you got to think about we're, we're, we just keep pushing the body harder and harder. And what we need to do is start to understand that balance. And so it is about, well, how do you start your day? Are you under a lot of stress? How do you neutralize that stress? What nutrients are you deficient in? We're like build the foundation up so that you get foundational things corrected. And then you can get into the exotic, right? I'm going to measure my telomeres because I want to live to 120, whatever. I mean, telomeres are cool. I mean, you know, it's interesting with the, you know, what's going on with them. You know, we obviously know that, you know, the more anti-inflammatory behavior we can put back in the body, your telomeres lengthen again. Yeah. When you're looking at the labs for your patients, is there something that 99% of them are deficient in? Magnesium. Okay. Num number one, man, mag. And you know why? Why is that? Yeah. Because mag is in plants. Oh my God, vegetables are evil. Chlorophyll. Magnesium is the center of a chlorophyll molecule. And if you look up the 5 million papers on magnesium as an essential nutrient, it is the number one nutrient deficiency, functional deficiency, associated with the development of metabolic syndrome and diabetes. And people get muscle cramps, muscle spasms, their blood sugars go up, they get more headaches, right? They get muscle fatigue, right? You know, it's, right? So when it's like going back to that thing about vegetables. Uh, you know, why are vegetables important? Because they provide micronutrients. Why is meat important? Because it provides a very important micronutrient called iron. And I see a lot of people that are magnesium deficient. And I'm seeing a lot of people that are either iron deficient or because they've got metabolic inflammation, they have enough iron, but they can't store it to ferritin. So they get more palpitations, they get more headaches. You know, their legs feel heavy going up steps and it's metabolic inflammation that prevents you from storing your iron into ferritin. So iron, ferritin, mag, really big. A lot of people have elevated homocysteine, right? They'll have a homocysteine above eight. They'll have a homocysteine 11, 12, 14. That's a clear sign of B vitamin deficiencies. And, uh, and obviously vitamin D for a lot of folks. I mean, hell, nobody gets outside, gets in the sun and you live at a certain point over the equator, you know, that whole, whole story, you know, people just don't get enough D. So those are the key ones. Got it. Can you get specific? Like what, uh, what form of magnesium? 
Sure. There's, there's all different types, right? Like, so what form, what doses do you recommend? How do you get iron? How do you get vitamin B? Yeah, absolutely. I can get real specific. So uh, magnesium bisglycinate or amino acid chelate, bisglycinate magnesium is my favorite. Um, mag- bisglycinate, not bis- glycinate. Bis- yeah, magnesium bisglycinate. It's the, the proper uh, amino acid chelate. Two glycines ha- hooked up to the magnesium versus one magnesium and one glycine. Okay. What, what's right? the benefit of that? Extra absorption. You absorb better. You know, if you look at it, at Albion, which is a which I have nothing to do with Albion, but they're a maker of amino acid chelates called Trax amino acid chelates. Tons of studies that they've done on their absorption characteristics and patterns, but that doesn't mean it's the only magnesium. So, mag bisglycinate, um, and I'll get the doses in a minute. You can get mag malate. Malate's good because it helps get lactic acid out of your muscle. So if you're working out, your muscles are sore, you can use mag malate, but mag malate will irritate the belly in some people. So like women with irritable bowel that are endurance runners, I'm not going to give them mag malate. Um, You hear a lot about magnesium threonate now, right? Mag teen, mag threonate, awesome product to calm your nerves, great magnesium for bedtime use. Problem is, when you take 2,000 milligrams of mag-3 and 8, you only get 144 milligrams of magnesium elementally. So you don't build your mag pool up real well with that. The threonine that's in it is good for calming your brain down, as is the mag, and it crosses the blood-brain barrier, and it does its job. Um, mag citrate, if it's just cheap, it's all you can afford, but you got to watch it. Don't get a loose stool. Dosing. The minimum I try people to get is 500 milligrams of elemental magnesium a day. Now, what does that mean? You have a 500 milligram capsule of magnesium, about 100 to 125 milligrams of that 500 milligram capsule will be elemental mag. So in order for you to get the magnesium, you need to take a couple capsules twice a day. That's the minimum. If you work out a lot or if you have a big deficiency, you can do it by weight, seven and a half milligrams per kilogram body weight. So take your body weight in pounds, divide it by 2.2, multiply it by seven and a half, and you're going to get the amount of mag you should take. If you're a big time athlete, like my folks that in pro sports or collegiate sports that I work with, or my, you know, my uh, military, I, I encourage them at 10 milligrams per kilogram because you, you use up your mag. And to your point, I don't know why we're all arguing about vegetables anyway because nobody's eating them right i mean it's like points kind of mute if you look at the data of average american they eat less than three vegetables a day so you know the world's safe uh is it also maybe because the vegetables are depleted because the soil is depleted very good point dan um we rapid grow things here right when you rapid grow things you don't rebuild your soil basin so, you know, when you eat a vegetable in Europe, it tastes so much different. The flavors are more robust. The, the, the pungentness maybe of a, of a green, like a, like a mustard green or something, you're like, wow. You know, and that's because it's a richer mineral content. So there's no doubt that the quality of our food in general, because of the amount of people we have to feed, is, you know, it's suspect, even if it's organic. I mean, just truthfully, even if it's organic, if you're rapid growing it, you got trouble, right? Um, right. And so that that's a that's, it's a really good point. And of course, there's the issue of hybridized grain and GMO and all that stuff that goes with it that affects our immune systems. But then there's you know all the pesticides that get sprayed, right? If you're not eating organic, you know 90% of all the pesticides that are made in the world are made for our food. They're not made for spiders in our house. You know they're made because of spraying on food and just remember, eat, you know, if your food's organic, great, but what's the farm next door? So you got to wash your food. You should be washing your food before you eat it for several reasons. But like getting residues off of that kind of stuff's important. So you, you bring up a good point in terms of, you know, n- what I call nutrient density in something like a, a vegetable or a fruit or anything. And look, even in modern ways that we process things, when you micronize grains, you mill them and really get them into fine powder to, to bake with them or whatever you're doing. 
you lose all the trace minerals that way. That's why they got to fortify the grains. Before we move on, you, you, did you mention gly- magnesium glycinate? Um, and is, it, did you leave it out for a reason? Well, magnesium bisglycinate. You could use magnesium oh. glycinate. But yeah, mag okay. glycinate's the best. Superior okay. to glycinate, you're saying. Yeah, these are the two. Okay. That, I, I didn't know if maybe it wasn't good because it was single or whatever. So No, no, no. It's good. Yeah. You can use it. It's all about budget, right? You got What you got to watch is like picking up magnesium amino acid chelate complex on the bottle. So the first ingredient, magnesium oxide. Second ingredient, magnesium gluconate. Third ingredient, magnesium amino acid chelate. And when they do that, it could be 95% oxide and gluconate, and they spritzed the glycinate in there, but they can make that claim. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, label claim, man. I'll tell you Uh, what, a lot of shrewd, sharky stuff going on with labels. Got it. Good to know. Okay. Um, So that's magnesium. Um, Can you go over how to get iron in the diet? And I think there's a couple more you said, right? Yeah, 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 sure. I'll go through them. No problem. I mean, look, the best way to do iron, honestly, look, plants don't do a good job of iron. Just going to tell you because of the phytates, you know, you know, it just, you just don't absorb iron very well from plants. Um, I do see some vegans that come to me every once in a while and some, or another, they got good iron, good ferritin, which I just tell them, keep doing what you're doing. If you believe in how you're eating, I don't want to change that. Right. Because sometimes it's a religious issue and I'm not about to try to work against someone's spiritual belief. Otherwise it's red meat, right? It's grass fed beef, bison, probably your two best elk, right? Um, you know, those are, those are really good sources of iron from a, you know, an animal protein perspective. And, you know, it really depends on well, is, how low is your iron. If your iron's really low when it comes back on a blood test and your doctor doesn't investigate it, you need to investigate it. You should do like an occult stool, make sure you're not having some kind of blood in your, in your stool. I'm sure they would do it though, but you should do it. Um, and so you get from supplements instead of, well, I'm going to get, do that next. So you okay. can take iron and you, and you take iron. You want to get a bisglycinate or a sucralmate. So a bisglycinate is gentler on your intestine versus like the ferrous gluconate, like that is out there. If you pick it off the typical retail shelf, that iron can be either constipating or irritating. The bisglycinates don't typically do that. Uh, so depending on how and you know low your iron is, the typical iron bisglycinate capsule will contain 29 milligrams of elemental iron. All right, so you can do iron, um, you know, do one or two a day based on how low you are. Right, if you're under 100, probably like if your iron's in the 70s, you probably want to do two a day for a month and then go to one a day maintenance. You got to remember, if you're somebody working out a lot. Say you're in, you like to bike or you you like to run or you're doing endurance stuff or even a heavy duty CrossFitter who's really pushing it. Um, I mean, I find anemias in college athletes all the time because the food they're eating is not that great and they're training four to six hours in a day. And that is a recipe for anemia, right? So if the more you exercise, the more you have to stay poised to look at where's my iron and ferritin level at. What are you sweating Uh, the iron out? Well, you're using it up because what's happening is, is you're using up your red blood cells when you work out and you got to build new ones and you need the iron to build the new ones. So you got good hemoglobin to hold on to that oxygen. Right. So that's what's happening. You sweat your magnesium out. You sweat your potassium out. You sweat your chloride out. You sweat your sodium out. You use up your zinc because you're making that insulin receptor work so hard. You need zinc for that. Um, So iron, either eat it or you could take a supplement. If you take a supplement of iron, it is best to take it every other day. What what about the the iron the doctors are prescribing? Um, What what version is that? It's usually like Fiasol. It's like an iron uh, gluconate or, you know, an iron sulfate. It usually, I mean, some people do fine with it and some people get constipated from it. All right. It's not toxic or anything. I mean, if you absorb it and your blood levels go up, good. Right. It's okay. 
But the, I just use the glycinate, the bisglycinate, mainly because I know it's gentle. I don't get people getting real constipated on it. And they build their arm pools up really nice. And I think that's, I mean, that's a key one, you know. And, uh, you know, you take it every other day. Because if you take it every day, you actually, when you take it daily, you actually start to signal not making ferritin. So you take it every other day so that you build your iron up and you build your ferritin up. All right. So that's a key piece that you got to, you know, you want to get. And then the, uh, you know, so that's kind of iron. Uh, you know, talking about B vitamins, look, you know, um, there's a plethora of B vitamins out there. Uh, do you want to use methylated? Well, if you know you have an MTHFR gene SNP, you know, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase gene SNP. You may need some methylfolate in order to, you know, get the benefit of the folate. Um, but typically if it's, you know, you know, called like a B50, you know, like a B complex where you're getting maybe a couple milligrams of methylfolate or one milligram of methylfolate, you're getting a denosylcobalamin or methylcobalamin for B12. 500 mics is usually plenty. You're getting B6 and at least I'd like 50 milligrams of B6 minimum because it's used so much. Um, niacinamide, same thing, 50 to 50 milligrams is plenty. B1, 50 to 100. Um, there's a lot of good easy B complexes. Just if you get a homocysteine back that's elevated, you want to make sure of these four B vitamins. Riboflavin, B6, pyridoxine, B12, and folic acid. Those four vitamins, and you can think of trimethylglycine or betaine helps too. But those four Bs are really important for getting your homocysteine level down. You said homocysteine, if it's up, that means you have inflammation in the body? Correct. And then therefore, these B vitamins will help do what? Well, it helps to process the homocysteine. So when you're, when you're using, when you're making glutathione, right, your body, everybody knows glutathione, nature's antioxidant for your body, right? And it also helps you make neurotransmitters. There's a whole bunch of stuff. But if glutathione, in the making of glutathione, you utilize an amino acid called methionine. And in the intermediate step of making glutathione or the methylation process, you make methionine goes to homocysteine. Then homocysteine goes back to methionine. If I get stuck at homocysteine, that goes up. And the problem with that is, is if you have a high homocysteine long enough, you're going to have kidney disease and dementia. And heart disease. Now, in regards to glutathione, now you mentioned that. Is that something to test for or something to be aware of? I mean, you could test for uh, you could test for glutathione for sure. Um, and I think you know it's a more a little more of an advanced test, just like doing tests for like deoxyguanosine for DNA damage. I mean, these are labs that you can get. So yeah, I mean, glutathione's worthy. You want to look, you can look at it, and uh, it would help you to understand my. You know, if you really want to understand, want to know a darn and dirty way to understand if your glutathione is probably deficient, check a urinary pH. Oh, okay. Because if your urine pH is low, you have an excess of hydrogen ions, and you're under high oxidative stress. Oh, that's a nice hack. And well, probably way cheaper. It, well, I'll tell you why it's important. People that have kidney disease right before they're getting ready to be put on dialysis, you know what they're told by their nephrologist? Take sodium bicarb capsules. Why? Your kidneys will stay in survival mode longer by alkalinizing your urine. And then there's studies that show you can regulate glucose, blood pressure, stat you take statins, get the lipids together. And if you don't change urinary pH, their renovascular disease, basically the kidneys getting damaged, continues to progress. So not that I'm beating up on a point, but how does your urine get more alkaline? What do you think it is? By eating more meat or eating more vegetables? I'm gonna go with meat. Vegetables. <laughs> vegetables. <laughs> vegetables. Yeah. Vegetables alkalinize your urine. Yeah. And, and, and once again, if you eat meat and you eat vegetables with it, you, you don't create the problem in your kidneys. That's why it's not always an either or, right? It's, uh, you know, 
but that that whole piece of understanding I'm, I'm telling you right now i have people now that come into me in their 50s and they're in stage four kidney disease already wow i, I, got, them, I got them in there i got them in their 50s and they're in stage two i got you know and we we reverse a lot of that stuff but but you know we reverse it by decreasing inflammation signaling are you exposed to mold do you have there did you get exposed to mold and your and your genes are sensitive to that do you have heavy metals present you know is your stress really high you know what's your diet look like right just go through the checklist of where are you off and then most importantly as you repair people they should notice that their symptoms get less <laughs> you know i mean i it's it that's the goal well i was inspired to get on your guys call and do this podcast with you as both of you have been in a journey where you have you're coming out the other end and you're feeling well and you're overcoming the issues that you had that's the goal i have a lot of people that just keep going to practitioners and like i said guys i'm not saying i got all the answers but i too teach a lot of doctors every year in the thousands how to work on people right and so my point is it isn't about giving people stuff so that they can live with what they have. It's how do we get them to move away from what they got, leave it behind, right? And get them back into a space of wealth, right? That's the key. Yeah. And you know, for us, it was a long journey of uh, looking for the root cause, you know, testing different diets, testing different treatments and, be, and being like, you know, what, what is like, what is the actual problem here? You know, if we could boil it down to one thing, um, you know, so what, you know, for me, I, I, I think I self-diagnosed, I think it's due to heavy metal toxicity, um, for Alex, he's still looking for that thing, right? So for people out there that are listening, what's, how do people navigate this journey of finding out what's really causing the problems? Well, you know, I think some of that's hard. I mean, just to be honest, it's kind of like, um, how do I know what's a good refrigerator when I buy it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You know, I mean, that's probably an easier question to answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully. Uh, but, but the problem is, is that people spend more time figuring out what the next refrigerator they're going to buy <laughs> is than they do researching their health. So, yeah, so the, I think um, one is you got to look for somebody that's got a great reputation in the area. You probably need help. It's very hard to navigate this yourself. You might get started on a journey and start to feel better. But to really get to that final, like, hey, the destination and the steps, I think it's probably going to take getting to work with someone who's knowledgeable, that you trust, and that you see results, right? And it's logical what they're saying. It's not like, let's try this now. Hey, let's try this now, right? It's not that. It's we're going to do this, and we're going to see how the results are. And then if that doesn't work, we're going to go here, and we're going to try this. And then we're going to measure how you're doing, right? It's it's creating a journey that's organized. And so um, I think to your point, you know, you look down that checkbox of what I said really quick earlier. Is it an environmental exposure, meaning things like metals? I mean, I've spent 35 years cleaning up people's toxic metals. Do they have mold exposure? Like you lived in a moldy house, you have HLA gene snips. The mold activated those gene snips. Now you're making a bunch of inflammatory chemicals. That's a big deal. That's on the up, uprise right now. My medical director in my medical informatics company wrote the only textbook on it in the world right now and tracked 5,000 people's MRIs and showed how it could restore the brain uh, volume by repairing that, right? How, how so, are you repairing that? How are you testing for it? Well, the test is fairly complex. So one is you do what's called a visual contrast screen, which was developed by the U.S. military. It's an eye test called a visual contrast screen. Now you get that at survivingmold.com. And then you start to, you have to give very specific things to bind up the inflam inflammatory compounds. Uh, two of them are medications, cholestyramine or Wellcall. The other one is, um, you know, okra powder. Okra is really good at binding similarly and it's ionic charge uh, to the drugs. They work, it works very similar. And then you gotta do something to improve liver, gallbladder, bile acid production. You gotta create, give phospholipids to repair the brain. And then once you pass your eye test, so you go back, you pass the eye test and you go, oh, I need to check for what's called biofilms in the sinuses. Then you do a nasal swab test. If you got them, 
you treat that with colloidal silver and EDTA to break down the biofilms, get rid of the bad bugs. Third step to restore the brain is you use a peptide called vasoactive intestinal peptide, VIP. It helps to restore the melanocyte stimulating hormone in your brain, which, which triggers your melanocortin system in your brain, which is responsible for immunity and knocking down neurodegeneration and regulating microglial cells. And then there's a bunch of labs that would correlate with that, you know, labs that you don't normally see, but you can get at, you know, lab course got them. I mean, you know, TGF beta one, anti-cardiolipin antibodies, metalloproteinases, there's different things you have to check just to see, well, how inflamed is this person due to that mold, right? Because it isn't, oh, you've got mold growing in your body. It's you got exposed, you triggered an inflammation engine that cannot be turned off. That's the key. And uh, it's pretty interesting. So that's metals, molds, pesticides, like where's my exposure? Um, and then did my gut break down due to being on antibiotics, being on birth control pills, being on metformin, being on acid blocking meds? Um, because I was under a lot of stress. Like a lot of people don't realize when you're really stressed, you'll break down your gut and you'll get gut permeability changes. And now I start reacting to food, triggering an inflammatory signals and creating that whole systemic effect of the gut brain interface, right? Hey, I just ate that food. Why do I feel so foggy headed now? You know, hey, I just ate that food. Why do I feel like I'm swelling? Why did I gain five pounds of water from morning to night? Well, you triggered histamine. And now you're sloshing around with five extra pounds of water. So it's just understanding the, the universe of what, where do we go? What do we do? So uh, for environmental toxins, what are the worst uh, viol or the worst uh, ones out there? What are the things people can do on a daily basis to protect themselves? Sure. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, so the big violators, of course, are things like mercury, cadmium, lead, arsenic, uh, poly, you know, the, the, the PCBs from the environmental perspective, you know, a lot of the different um, pesticides are pretty big. Uh, but, you know, if you just go with metals, you know, lead and mercury are a pretty big problem. Uh, if you were treated for, uh, say, breast cancer and you had a lot of platinum-derived uh, chemotherapy, you got to get the platinum out of you because it stores in your bone. Um, and so that's the big one. What do you do every day? Wipe your feet off because 20% of that dust on the bottom of your foot is probably lead. Whoa. A lot of people don't realize really? that, that the dust, well, think about it, man. Look at the a granular stuff that's on your car. Like you wash your car, yeah. it's super clean. If you're lucky and you got a garage, it stays clean. But outside, how much of a film is on your car in just one day? Tons, right? yeah. Yeah. But I think 20% is lead, though. Yeah. That, Where's it coming know. from? Oh, my God. Well, lead. So all the lead that's ever been done. So do, do airplanes still use lead in their fuel? I wasn't aware they did. They do? Yeah, there's still, wow. there's still, there's still lead. Uh, there's still countries that have lead in their gasoline. Like unleaded gasoline is just, well, I mean, look, you have additives like MPTP. That's just as big a problem, right? So, you know, lead, it, you know, all the lead that's ever been put into the environment is recirculated either through the animals or through the air, right? So, you know, lead, it's not like lead just goes away, right? I mean, there's a lot of lead put into our environment. It's one of the biggest things I see in people, especially people my age. Uh, newspapers had lead in the, in the print, you know, lead in wallpaper, lead in paint. You know, there's, you know, just a ton of lead exposure that was out there. And then, you know, how often do you hear about people that are eating fish and they get a ton of mercury in them? Today, not like 20 years ago, I'm talking about today. You know, people eat a lot of fish, they end up with mercury. And so, you know, so obviously eat smaller fish, eat river fish, eat lake fish. Uh, but the problem is, is that, you know, all the all the treated lumber that everything was ever built with was high in arsenic until they outlawed arsenic for treated lumber about a decade ago. And a lot of that stuff gets into our aquifer. 
So when you read about buying household filters, what do they talk about? Filtering out lead and filtering out arsenic, and right? So, so it, it's just looking, you know, you want to look at you as a part of the ecosystem. And whatever's out there in that ecosystem, you got a chance at getting it. And some people are better at getting rid of it than others. So what can you do to get rid of it? I love when people do saunas. So whether you do infrared sauna or traditional sauna, that's a great way to sweat stuff out. Because these types of toxins, whether it's pesticides, metals, a lot of them store in fat tissue. You can sweat, sweat them out some. Um, lose weight. Get to your ideal weight. Don't be overweight. You store toxins in fat tissue. Um, and look, I say that not out of, you know, I've been fortunate. I'm able to keep my weigh what I weighed when I was 16 now. When I was playing football, I weighed about 285. A big difference now at 203. Um, but, you know, my brother was a 476-pound guy. I, mean, I, I love people of all size. So I'm not, you know, anybody that's listening, don't take offense to me saying if you're overweight or you're fat, get the fat off. Uh, my, my mother was obese. You know, my, my father was an overweight diabetic until he came to live with me at 79. Uh, and then he got to his ideal weight and he survived his Whipple surgery 13 years at the age of 79, which nobody does. No, yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, he was a chef that had type 2 diabetes, had a duodenal cancer, which is totally common in diabetics. They have eight times more, have four to eight times more cancers of the major cancers, right? So he got that out. We cleaned his chemistry up. Guy lives 13 more years. Now, I don't want to digress, but it is important that I bring this in. When we talk about these blue zone countries where people live a long time, we forget to talk about the context of they keep their older folks relevant. They're still living in the society. They still count. We talk to them. We make them a part of our lives, right? We don't shove them in a nursing home and go, hey, I'm going to come visit you once a week and bring you something nice, right? I mean, I know that sounds cruel, but when I brought my father into my home, right, I mean, a Whipple surgery at the age of 79, he already was a diabetic for 40 years. His life expectancy was two years. But he started cooking for his grandson. So breakfast, he's cooking for his grandson, man. He's digging getting up in the morning. And he's going to baseball games and football games and wrestling matches. And he's going everywhere with us. Like, it wasn't like, hey, Grandpa, yeah, you stay at home. The family is going to go do something. He was a part of the unit. And I firmly believe that was every bit as powerful as anything I did for him by changing his diet and giving him nutrients and all that, giving him purpose and meaning. So I, I had to digress to say that because it's incredibly important. Um, and then what else can you do other than sauna? Make sure you're drinking plenty of water. If you want to take some things preventatively, chlorella is a really good metal detoxifier. Use cilantro. Cilantro is a good metal detoxifier. If you want to do something a little more aggressive, um, you know, fulvic acid is pretty good at helping to chelate metals on your own. And then when you go from there, you start getting help from people. You might use uh, an amino acid called DMSA or dimercaptosuccinic acid. Uh, you could do it orally really well. I've done IV. I mean, I've done IV detox. I've done suppositories. Did a human study with. EDTA suppositories. And, you know, we had a human study, got 95% of the lead out of about 30 people, I think, at the end of the trial uh, by using a suppository every day because you got a huge, rich blood supply in that, you know, in your rectal tissue. It, it's weird, but in the U.S., nobody likes, nobody likes suppositories. You know, if you're in other countries, no, I mean, other countries are like, Sure, it's another way we deliver medicine. Jim, do you think that everybody should should do metal detoxes? I think everybody should at least do a maintenance. What does that look like then? Once a year? I mean, look, I think you ought to take chlorella fairly often. Say eat cilantro fairly often. If you can get in a sauna, get in a sauna. I mean, shoot, you can get them sauna boxes now, like 300 bucks. You can get a sauna that you can stand up in your room and you can do the darn things, right? I think, I think there's a really good Epsom salt baths. I mean, I think you, and, and then how am I eating? I, I, 
do you do you guys wash your food before you eat it? Let me ask. Do you? Wash yeah, we your do. Food? We do. Good yep. for you. Good. Yeah. So smart. Use, uh, vinegar or baking soda. Yeah. Yeah. Doctor Bronner. Sometimes yeah. Hydrogen bun- peroxide. Bunch of different things. Yeah. Great, uh, yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, nice. you know, listen, we do it all. We do the sauna. Daniel does the DMS, whatever, you know, and, and shit like that. Yeah. Yeah. Which um, I, for personal reasons, can I, you know, ask you a little bit more about that? Cause all right. So um, what are your thoughts on like um, ALA versus DMSA, EDTA? Um, I did Andy Cutler's protocol, which was ALA plus DMSA. I've had some people tell me that that's old school. doesn't really work very well. Um, ALA isn't really a chelator, which I don't know. It seemed to do crazy things to me. Um, and then, but on the EDTA side, um, I've heard that it doesn't, it, that's not actually a chelator and that it actually, it's been shown to reduce cardiovascular events, but it doesn't necessarily, it hasn't been shown to pull out metals, blah, blah, blah. So it's, there's like a lot of conflicting stuff out there. So wondering what your take is. So, I mean, alpha lipoic acid in and of itself is not a great chelator, but what alpha lipoic acid is good is that when you're chelating, it helps reduce oxidative burden and you're eliminating the metal. So you really, it's very protective. It's a great adjunctive, very smart to take alpha lipoic acid because it gets metabolized to dihydrolipoic acid so that you downregulate things like vascular adhesion molecule one because of the whole upregulation of peroxyl nitrites and superoxide anions that occur in your body. So you, you start pulling out these metals and, and, you know, it starts wreaking havoc on you. You want to have some protection on board. And so that ALA is very good at that. So that's kind of where that's at. Um, anybody that says EDTA doesn't chelate uh, simply hasn't given EDTA to people to chelate them. I mean, I've got, I've got, people where I can show you their toxic metal urine profile, which is an American board of pathology lab, you know, challenge. Here's your, here's your lead. Now, now we give you the EDTA suppository and the lead goes down. I mean, either it's going down or it isn't, uh, you know, and uh, I don't think EDTA orally works all that great. Just, you know, straight up, I think you've got to do it by IV and then you got to be careful on that. Um, or you do suppositories, but EDTA works. Look, when I did my study on EDTA suppositories, I measured fecal metals, urine metals, right? And blood. I measured all three coming out of people when I did this trial. And what you'll find is sometimes a metal's chelating more out of the blood than it is out of the urine. It doesn't mean it's not coming out just means that there's a different pathway that it's being excreted. And DMSA being old school, I kind of, I mean, what are you using if you're not using DMSA? I mean, DMSA is easy on the body. It chelates. I mean, I've got 500 cases I could show you of DMSA getting rid of platinum in women who are breast cancer survivors. You know, their mercury comes down, their leg comes down. I mean, I think it's a simple way that you can chelate. I mean, I like the program that you're on, man. That DMSA plus ALA is not bad. Now, yeah, I think they were saying it's a bit harsh because um, I think everyone agrees DMSA is good. I'm, I'm doing it every three hours for three oh days. Oh, my God. That's, yes, you know, that's a different. Uh, so the, they said the protocol is too intense. Yeah, no, I might agree with that. Yeah. So the way we do, I'm just, you know, like I've only been doing this for four decades, so don't listen. Uh, uh, so, Tell but, us the human way to do it, not not the crazy man way to do it. Uh, yeah, I just here's how I do it. I I base it based on your kidney filtration. So if your GFR is above seventy, you know your your filtration rate of your kidneys are above seventy, you can do a thousand milligrams a day two days in a row, and then you take off five days. And just, that's just once a day. Just take a thousand milligrams. Thousand milligrams in the morning, once a day, and then you do it again the next day, and then you don't do anything for you don't do any more of the heavy duty stuff for five days, and you replete minerals on those days. If you choose to do another chelation, you could do an EDTA suppository. Two days of a DMSA, off a day, a suppository, off a day. So suppository off a day. So three doses of every other day suppository, then you hit another round of DMSA 
that'll chelate you fast and you keep your minerals in you. Um, and that's pretty solid. I mean, doing like dosing DMSA every few hours, that's where you got to worry about you're kicking too much up. Your kidneys a lot of times can't take that. So you got to be watching your, you know, you got to watch your pH of your urine your, and you got to watch your filtration rate. Um, so that's the part you got to be careful of. Um, so God, yeah. it's small doses though. It's like, um, I know hundred milligrams. It's okay. like, no, it's like even less. It's like 25, um, 25 ALA, 25 DMSA, something like that. Yeah. Um, well, you could spend all day doing it or you could just do it in the morning. That's true. It sounds a lot, way, way easier. Yeah. <laughs> but now if your GFR, GFR is below 70, like 55 or like 60 to 70, 500 milligrams, two days in a row. And then if your GFR is below 60, meaning you're in you know early stage renal, you, go, you do 250 milligrams once a day for two days. And then you're giving stuff to repair the kidneys, of course. Got it. Cool. And then one more thing. Um, I'm looking at Andy Cutler's book right now. Um, and he, this is all about mercury detox. Yep. And he says EDTA is not clinically useful chelator for mercury, even though it increases the amount of mercury that shows up in the urine in an actual human body it does not chelate mercury from sensitive organs or clear it. It will make you worse by moving mercury from harmless locations into your brain and other sensitive organs. I, where's the, does he have like some scans on mercury brain? I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't think I would use EDTA for mercury. I would use DMSA for mercury. Nothing better than EDTA for getting rid of lead. And really what we found in our human trial where we actually tracked it and if he's doing trials, I love it. So, you know, it's cool. Um, what we found is when we got the lead level down, the body's glutathione capacity goes up and you start getting rid of other metals. We had the problem in Cincinnati when we did this because we had a lot of uranium because the phenol uranium uh, processing plant was there and they dumped hundred million pounds of radioactive dust in the air by mistake over 20 years. You know, pst, oh, can't, believe, can't believe we did that. Uh, so I had to track everything for uranium, the lead, arsenic, the cadmium, the mercury, I've never seen anyone, um, now personally, I haven't seen anyone where they got mercury brain, like they became mad as a hatter, right? Which is the whole thing of mercury brain by doing EDTA. But I also think that people, you know, it's like everything, you know, we learn, right? You know, new ideas don't get accepted, old people die. You know, it's that thought of EDTA, IV was the only thing people were doing. And now as we progress in our knowledge of metals, you know, EDTA is not the thing to do for everyone. And I think it's every bit as important that you're sopping up those extra metals by taking chlorella, taking folic acid on your off days so that you're continuing a gentle detoxification, adequate antioxidants to protect the kidneys and the liver and the lungs because you exhale the stuff too, right? So all of that stuff's important, man. I mean, it's a metal, metal, environmental burden's a big deal. I mean, it, it's, it's a big deal. I mean, pesticides are horrible. The metals are horrible. Pesticides are particularly horrible because a lot of times they have a metal attached to a lipid so it penetrates the cell more. So if you eat olives, you guys like olives or you hate olives? Yeah, love them. You eat organic ones? Yeah. Good. Because you know what one of the pesticides they use on olives are? Lead arsenate. Wow. Two Even joys combined. <laughs> yeah. Double, double the hit, man. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. So, wow. so can we recap like like the, the the entry level detoxification? I know you mentioned sauna, a few other things. Like, can you give us frequencies and, and this stuff so that sure. people can start going in that direction before they go to the ALAs and stuff? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, you know, um, what I like doing on saunas, I love people using a loofah sponge, you know, you know, you know, kind of rough up around your lymphatic areas, right? Under the arms and the inguinal and the groin areas, you know, you can, you loofah. I like if people do maybe 25 milligrams of niacin to get a little bit of a rush, like get a little bit of that blood 
tingling, not, you don't need to do a hundred. You don't have to make yourself like itchy, but if you do a little, that kind of gets the blood up and flowing. Right. And then what about binders when they're doing the sauna? Well, it's, I was going to say, you could, you could get out of the sauna, take some binders, you know, and that's where the, like the fulvates and the chlorellas and the, and the uh, cilantro's and those kind of things that, you know, acetylcysteine, a lot of those things can, you know, can all help. The other thing is, is don't wipe yourself off with a towel when you get out of the sauna, right? Cold shower. That's what I do. Well, what good? you want to do is you want to soap yourself up really good. You can do cold, soap, but you want to use soap because if you've sweated out these things, well, you don't want to rub them back in. You would soap your body up as a surfactant, right? Soap is a surfactant and gets rid of those compounds. So make sure you get a good soap up on you and then do your shower, whether it's cold, warm, whatever. Cold showers feel good, right? You a little bit of that of cytokine effect, right? Uh, which is fine. Do you have a, a period of how quickly you have to do that? Because sometimes you go to the gym, sauna, then you get home 30 minutes later. Is there a window? No, not really. You can get home and do it. You're okay. Just do it. Uh, and then the other one is, is you know, I'll tell you what I love is uh, even for a, here's a cheap hack for washing your vegetables too, is Dawn ditch detergent. Really? So Dawn, uh, you, you don't want to use the floral scents, right? Could kind of make all your vegetables taste bad, but they got unscented. Dawn's one of the most pro- powerful surfactants on the planet. Like if you get poison ivy, if you live in an area where you could be exposed to poison ivy, all you got to do is when you come in from the woods is you put Dawn on you, let it sit for three minutes, get in the shower, get rid of it. And the Dawn pulls the Uriah shawl, which is the oil resin that creates that reaction right out of your tissue. It does the same thing for lipophilic compounds on your food. So a few drops of Dawn, make it a little soapy, put it in there, and it acts as a really nice surfactant. It's another one. It's like those commercials we used to see, right, with the little baby ducks covered in oil. and I, So it's real, huh? It's not just marketing. Well, I knew the inventor. The inventor actually came to me, and uh, uh, I knew him well. And he was, you know, I got the inside scoop on Dawn. Wow. I thought it was some chemical soap we should stay away from. So that's good to know. Well, I'm not wanting you to drink it. So, you know, it's not going to help us with a detox. Yeah, but just a little bit, just a little bit. It's an excellent surfactant, you know, really helps out. Um, So, no, I mean, so the rest of that detox is drink plenty of water. And you should also make sure you're getting minerals, especially whether you're like, I don't care what diet you're eating. Most likely you're deficient in minerals. I mean, it's, it's a pretty safe bet. Pretty safe, bet, right? And uh, if you're sweating, depending on what region of the country you're in, how much you train, you got to take some electrolytes, get enough mag in there, make sure you're repleting your minerals. Because, you know, you, you know, when you sweat a lot, you pull those things out and you need those minerals in order to go through the phases of detoxification in your body. So your liver needs those minerals as cofactors to the enzymes that are helping you make the ability to detoxify. So mineral content matters. Amino acids matter, right? Glycine, really important, right? So cysteine, glycine, those kind of things. Very cool. Awesome. Very cool. Um, I know we're coming up to the end of the show. I really want to talk about the metabolic code. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, kind of, kind of give us an idea of, um, you know, why we need this, where it's taking us, like how, how we can help, you know, our chronic illness. Yeah. I mean, metabolic code came about cause I, you know, was seeing 300 to 400 people a week, every week. And I kept seeing people drop into these clustered groups. You know, it was adrenal thyroid pancreas, cortisol, thyroid, blood sugar, and insulin. And when that was off, I'm getting fatter. I'm feeling tired, feeling stressed. My blood sugars are going up. My thyroid's going down. <laughs> Gut immune brain, you know, I'm anxious, I'm nervous, I'm bloated, I'm gassy, I'm depressed. Cardiopulmonary neurovascular, my lipids are up, my resting heart rate's high, my heart rate variability is down, I'm having trouble getting up and down steps, I'm holding fluids. Uh, liver, lymph, kidney, right? Uh, how I detox, you know, kidney, liver function, anemias, 
And then the fifth is sex hormones. So the metabolic code is all about uh, getting your labs, taking a questionnaire, all of it filtering in to these five buckets. And it's got a, about a 40,000 uh, decision algorithm in it that takes them and says, you know, it's one thing if your blood sugar is 95, but if your blood sugar is 95 and your blood pressure is 130 over 95 and your serum potassium is low and your red blood cell magnesium is low and you're making bad actor lipids and your kidney function starting to go down, well, now all of a sudden you have a lot more going on in that insulin resistance bucket. And maybe we should focus there as a way to get you feeling better quicker. Right. So it basically in learning theory, people learn in fives and threes. And when I started to design this, like there's no way when you, when I'm sitting there explaining somebody's chemistry, they're going to remember 10 percent of it. Person loses 88 percent of a, of a doctor's office visit, a six minute visit within 48 hours. So I had to you know, work on how do we make this simple? So things flow into these five archetypic buckets and then we go, oh, you need to work on gut immune brain. We got to work on your diet. Look where your immune system's at, your autoimmune or, you know, hey, you're uh, foggy headed. You're, you know, not, not, you know, you're, you're anxious, you're perseverating, whatever that reason is. So we've, we developed that and uh, actually 14 weeks of the, the capstone course at George Washington School of uh Medicine and Health Sciences, their Integrative Medicine Master's Program is all on our algorithm. Uh, so we obviously 18 years of teaching at the College of Medicine and Pharmacy and taught at the uh, New York uh, Chiropractic and Oriental Medical School I've, you know, at GW now. To, we keep collecting this data so that you can take a lab test, you answer questions and you go, hey, where do I start? Because I think that's the biggest question is where do I start? How do I get to feel better quickest? Uh, we're using this at Lifetime. So it's a health club, about million and a half members, 170 plus clubs. We're going to really start to categorize because here's what's happened. And, and Dan, you know, this is in pharmacy. I can name any three drugs and we don't have a study on how they all do together in the body. Nope. It's not there. So then we start to ask, then we start to say, oh, I'm going to be keto. Oh, I'm going to take these nutrients. Oh, I'm going to exercise this way. Is the universe of what you're doing reducing your metabolic code scores, your metaflammation index? Are you reversing your symptoms? Are you reversing your labs based on what your plan is? And are you doing it? Because now it isn't about Oh, uh, this one herb fixes everything. It's about your program moves you in the right direction. My labs are reversing. My symptom scores are down. I, you know, quality of life's better. Uh, and that's the, that's why the metabolic code was developed was to really start to prove that what we think, what we do, what we believe in matters get people on the journey of reversing their chemistry before it's too late. And of course, you know, when we've got a fair amount of folks that are starting to wake up to our platform now, because they're seeing that, Hey, this makes it pretty easy to, you know, look at labs that are pretty complex, right. But makes it simple. It's, it's easy to make simple, simple. And it's very hard to make complex, simple. And a lot of times when you go to a functional medicine doc or an integrated medicine doc, they put down that 10 pages of paper and they write little squiggly notes on it. This is bad. This is good. Smiley face, more B, more knack, less, less egg yolks, whatever. Right. And you get that piece of paper and, oh, what did he say about that? So this kind of codifies, here's where you're at. This is what it means when your lab's in this range. And then, what do you do about it? And then in addition to that, it delivers different diets to people based on where they're at, uh, which, which are pretty thorough. I mean, I got a team of three dietitians with 70 years experience in the integrative and natural medicine space. Uh, so they're pretty sharp on diet theory. And we go by the literature and we go by what works for people. We don't get religious about one thing, right? We try to figure out the right things for people. 
And that was based on my metabolic code book that I published in 2002, which everybody was like, this is crazy. And now everybody's talking about systems biology because it was the first, one of the first books on systems biology, healthcare, like looking at things together. Uh, and a re reshoot on that's coming out this year too. We got a whole new, got a couple books coming out this year. Cool, cool. So, so not being in Fort Worth, um, how do you get access to this? Well, uh, you go to metaboliccode.com. You could find out there's a practitioner in the area. Uh, certainly, if there's people that want to run those kind of tests, I mean, my two clinics, we do telehealth. Uh, but if people want to just find a practitioner near them, uh, send a note into metaboliccode.com. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, thank you so much, Jim. This has been uh, very, very enlightening and an honor to speak with you. And if you're open to it, we'd love to have you on again. This is fun. I told you guys to have me on all you want, man. I think you guys are amazing. I love what you're doing. Thanks. Thanks. We love what you're doing, too. We're big fans. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. Thanks for you spending your afternoon with us. Sure, man. You guys have a great day.